questions. So um, today I'm going to talk to you about the data management plan. Um, but first I want to give you a little introduction of myself. Um, I actually have a science background, but after working in the lab for a few years, decided to move and uh, try something different. So I actually got a job in, in the pharma industry. Uh, they were setting, this company in particular was setting up regional data management centres. And so I actually went there for 10 years and I had experience across a lot of different roles because it was, because we were doing that data management for all studies in the region. So I did data entry, data validation, CRF design, and then database design and creation, including rules and edit checks. Um, and now I've been at the Telecom Kids Institute for five years, mainly working in studies of infectious disease and vaccines. <clears throat> um, our COA Plus um, was developed by the FDA. Um, it's a set of guiding principles to ensure data integrity. Um, so I, I think we all have an idea of what data integrity is, um, but I kind of wanted to look it up for myself. And I, I think this sums it up. It's the overall accuracy, completeness, and consistency of data and refers to the safety of data in regard to regulatory compliance and security. And the way to maintain data integrity is through a collection of processes, rules, and standards implementing during the study. Um, so the initial Alcoa was uh, five guiding principles and then four more were added and they coined the term of Alcoa Plus. And so I'll go through those principles. Oh. Why is that not? Sorry, it's not going to the next one. There you go. Uh, so attributable, attributable. So can that data be, uh, can it be shown who entered that data and who made any changes? Um, legible, so you should be able to read the data. And also I think for, you know, for paper studies, is it legible? But for electronic studies, is it, is the data in a format that is usable? Uh, contemporaneous refers to, is it entered in a timely manner? So paper studies may be more of a challenge when the data is entered later uh, compared to electronic studies where the data may be entered directly. Uh, so just something to consider. Original, so the data that is initially uh, collected should be the data that is used for further processing analysis. Um, accurate, uh, the data should be, excuse me, complete and free from errors, which I think can be achieved through um, good CRF design. Um, and also in databases, we can uh, design the forms to include edit checks and range checks to assist in that. Um, uh, consistent, enduring, and available. So I think that enduring and available really refers to the, the long-term storage and being able to retrieve that data. Um, I think to myself about some studies that I worked on that are probably have all the data stored on a CD in a warehouse somewhere. And, uh, you know, I think if we ever had to go back and retrieve that data, how easy would that be? We wouldn't be able to probably find a CD drive for a start. Would the data on that CD be useful? Yeah, it's uh, things that you need to be considerate of what may happen in the future and making sure that that data is um, future proof, really. Um, so the purposes of a data management plan. So really it's to document and collect document the collection and handling of data. So really what types of data, what systems will be used. Uh, it ensures compliance with regulatory requirements and SOPs, et cetera. And to document the methods by which this data quality integrity will be achieved. Um, I think it's one of the easiest ways to document the data integrity and it would, um, if, if my way of thinking was, is if the study protocol 
documents what we're collecting and why we're collecting it, then the data management plan should be how we're collecting it. And that should specify all, everything that's needed. And it's really a result of the decisions about, about the data that are made during the study design. So I know that it's one of those things that um, can be an afterthought. People fill in a data management plan because it's a requirement and they're told they need to do it. But I think that used properly, it can be a really useful tool. So because um, all decisions that are made uh, can kind of be documented and it really helps, helps you understand how the process is going to work. Um, uh, it can be implemented as a single document as well as pointers to other study documents. So you wouldn't reinvent something that already exists. You just might create a link to the study protocol, for example. And should be written in a manner that could be used as a job aid for someone new to the study. Um, I always think about our studies. Some of our studies, it says in the protocol, we need to archive them for 25 years. Um, I know I'm probably not, probably not still going to be working in 25 years. So we need to make sure that there is documentation of what has happened in the study so that if I'm not around, someone can pick it up and work out what's exactly gone on. Um, so creation and maintenance um, ideally should start as early in the study design as possible. Um, usually once the protocol is kind of almost complete, I think you should start to think about what types of data need to be collected and then exactly how that's going to be collected. So your study might have, as well as the regular clinical data, you might have um, questionnaires, um, study diary cards. Um, you might have blood lab samples that are going to be sent off and, and the lab results will come back. Um, all of those things, you need to work out how that's going to be collected and the best method for that. So it also... Um, so it's really helpful to kind of answer any of those questions and make sure everything's going to be collected in, a, in an easy manner. And once the initial version is complete and it's all finalised, that should be approved by study personnel and then version tracking um, should occur if any changes are made up to that. Um, some of the recommended contents. Uh, which is by no means a fixed list or an exhaustive list. I think you really need to make it work for your study. So uh, firstly, there's that documentation of approval and version control, um, definitions and acronyms as they apply to your study. Uh, protocol summary, I would probably, usually I put a small summary, um, but refer to the main protocol um, to the scope this excuse me the scope of data management operations covered so exactly what uh, is going to be involved in that um, project management so could involve what timelines this study might have um, any interim locks that are planned data locks um, options like that um, data sources is where you start to really identify exactly where each data point is going to come from. So you, you might have um, different paper forms that the patient's got to fill in and send back, or they might be filling an online questionnaire. Um, all that type of thing kind of needs to be identified and, uh, and specified. Um, I think a really useful tool that I like to use is um, this a data flow diagram. I've got an example here of one that we've used. Uh, so you can see for this study, there's like the source data of a patient record. Um, the research nurse then enters the data. We have two options. There's like um, an app. If, if there's no internet available, they can use that. If there is internet, they can just enter it directly into the database and all ends up into this um, Medrio database that we've used. Then edit checks. 
um, can be generated automatically or manually, go back to the nurse, etc. It also shows the lab data and the results being uploaded. Um, so I, I just think this kind of can clear things up if people are trying to get, get clear in their minds where everything is coming from. So it's, it's really useful, but obviously not required, but I, I would recommend it definitely. Um, more recommended content, so the CRF. Um, if you have a paper CRF, I'd probably just include a, a reference to that document itself, not, not, not duplicate it. Uh, or if you're just directly doing an electronic CRF, you'll just note that. Um, data definition, also um, often referred to as a data dictionary. So it has the uh, data label, the data types, um, any code lists, just specifically all of those that information about every data element that's collected. Um, data mapping refers to taking each of those data elements and putting them on, um, mapping them back to the CRF. So you might have an annotated CRF that has all those labels and it's just an easy way to kind of be able to refer back to each data question so that people can show that flow of what, what each data element means. Um, traceability, um, most, most clinical trial databases have that built-in traceability where you can see an audit trail of who entered the data. Um, so that's, that's a very important thing to have. Um, system access and user privileges. Um, you might, you probably need to have different, you may need to have different roles for your study. For example, uh, we have a study where <clears throat> there are blinded users and unblinded users. So the unblinded users perform randomization and they perform the vaccine, the study drug uh, vaccinations, but the unblinded users can't view those pages so they remain blinded. So you need to specify that type of thing. Uh, data, data systems used, what database you're going to use for the study. Uh, development and testing. Um, in terms of testing, Usually whoever's doing the development will be doing system testing as they develop, but I think it's really important to do user acceptance testing so that the end user is actually uh, trying out all the forms and making sure they're gonna work within the clinical uh, setting. Also, if possible, we can get the statisticians to check the outputs and make sure that it's gonna match up with their needs because um, that's another important factor. And system security, obviously, um, each system's um, going to have its own security, but uh, process, uh, sorry, organizational processes around that security. Um, is there going to be a regular review of what users have access to the system and make sure that people that no longer work on the study, for example, are going to be removed? Uh, backup and recovery, ensure that each system has that so we don't lose that very crucial data. Um, data collection and processing. So um, exactly how is that going to work? The data is collected at sites. Is there a process for correcting data discrepancies? Um, do we need to do any medical coding such as MEDRA, um, Dictionary for Adverse Events? And then integration of other data that's been collected, such as lab data. And then data quality control, kind of running, running reports during the study, study to make sure that uh, there's not missing data, things like that. Um, and I think it's important to do that as the study progresses rather than waiting to the very end. And that should kind of be planned. Uh, database lock and unlock if needed. And, and data archival. So that's, I think they're the main important things. Um, do I need a data management, data management plan? I would always say yes. Um, I mean, GCP says that we should include something like this, but even 
if you don't consider that, it's a really useful tool and it's a really good way to document all of this information. Um, if you don't have one and you want to start, uh, depending on where you work, you may already have a template. I know that Telephone Kids Institute has a template that we can use. Um, if you don't have a template, there are lots of templates online um, that people have shared. Or there's also this website, the dmptool.org, uh, where you can go in and specify and it kind of takes you through the process um, and helps you create your data management plan. Um, and then there's just some references. Um, so I think that's, I will stop my slides now. Um, not Thank here. you so much, Kylie. And just to <laughs> remind I can work people, out how to do it. Sorry. <laughs> I can remind people to enter any questions they have, or if you wish to share comments too, please don't hesitate to use the uh, chat. Um, moving seamlessly on to um, Tracy, if you'd like to start sharing. Okay, let's see if I can get this working. Nope. We can see that on the other side. Can you see the correct view? Yes. Oh, perfect. Okay. Um, hi, everybody. So my name is Tracy Mears, and I'm going to talk a little bit about the data monitoring aspect of um, managing data integrity. Um, oh, sorry, I'm just making sure the... Um, has the slide moved on for Michael? Has the slide moved on? Yes. Yep. Oh, okay. All right. Um, so um, a bit of an outline of what I'm going to talk about. Um, I'm going to give you a little bit of a background about me um, and then talk about um, CRF and database design, um, why data monitoring is required, um, the evolution of um, data monitoring, and some information about activities of data monitoring and data cleaning. So um, to tell you a little bit about me, um, not just so you can calculate how, how old I am or how long I've been working in clinical research, um, I, I kind of tell people this story because um, I have been working in clinical operations for a number of years now, but I do come from a data management background. And I remember when I was in data management, you know, people used to talk about how valuable that experience was, and it's only once you live it that you you actually realise it is um, super important. And I think um, data integrity is kind of a combined um, role, you know, data management, the statistics team, and the clinical operations team. Um, but I would I feel like my approach is always maybe from more of the data management statistics point of view um, rather than um, a clinical operations role. So I started in a CRO many years ago. Um, I then moved to Big Pharma and spent five years there in data management before I moved into clinical operations. Um, and while I was in Big Pharma, I managed a study of about 3,000 um, participants. It was global, um, many sites, um, and that was an adjuvant chemotherapy study. Um, I moved on from Big Pharma eventually and I've managed first in man studies, you know, in a team of two, essentially. Um, so I've, I feel like I've seen quite a range of um, studies and um, data capture instruments and data cleaning ways. So um, just kind of sharing that with you um, so that you understand a little bit about where I come from as I um, give you my views on data monitoring. So I think one of the first critical parts of um, ensuring data quality is with the um, CRF or database design. So, you know, back in the day, we designed a paper CRF and then we designed a database off that. Um, and I think we've uh, evolved to a point now where we design sort of a database and, and it's um, data entry directly into the database, which is obviously way more efficient. And um, I think it's great for data quality because you don't have um, transcription issues and you're not trying to move data from one system to another. Um, the CRF design is really critical um, because that's where we need to think about what data we need to answer our questions, why we need it, and um, how we'll collect it. And um, I'm actually stealing this um, sort of idea from Julie, who um, 
it has a, a lovely view of um, the data that we collect as part of our studies is um, it needs to be friendly for the for the first user. So the data entry person at the site who's collecting the information, as well as what and then we sort of put it into the database and take it out for stats. And so it needs to be user friendly for both ends of the spectrum. Um, otherwise, you know, we won't get to where we need to go. So um, the CRF design, I think, or the database design is a real collaboration and um, does actually involve some compromise from both the operations people and the stats people and some understanding. Um, and when I say I kind of um, come from a more sort of data management stats point of view is when I'm in an early phase in a study, um, I'm for minimal data. Do we really need it? Um, and if we don't really need it, why are we putting it there? Because the more we collect, the more we've got to manage, the more we've got to track, um, you know, and scientists and clinicians, I guess, to a certain point um, are often like, well, if we can get that data, it could be of interest to us at some point down the track. Um, so I think it is a, a real balancing act um, to know what to collect. And I also feel like um, once you've got a robust draft of your protocol, um, it's when you start to design the database that you really start to operationalize um, what you're you know, what you're looking to achieve and how you're going to achieve it. So um, why do we need to bother doing data monitoring? Um, I think it's pretty simple. It's the, if we put rubbish in, then we're going to get rubbish out. I think that's pretty standard. Um, so we need to be really careful that we're putting good quality data in um, and that will influence what data we get to um, analyze and work with for our results. Um, when I was sort of doing a bit of web searching um, to come up with some more facts for this talk, rather than just kind of my experience and opinions, I did come across a paper from 2005. Um, the reference is there for you. Um, and that nicely said that data cleaning intends to identify and correct errors or at least minimize their impact on study results. And I do think that nicely sums up why we do data monitoring. Um, and of course, it can never be a cure for poor study design or uh, or study conduct, or for poor CRF design, because if you you know you've got what you've got, then. And so I said the data monitoring has evolved so much in the twenty-ish years that I've been working in clinical research. Um, I remember, you know, in, in the early days, it was um, gosh, carbon copy paper where you sort of would write on a page and get three copies to. Um, paper CRFs that would be faxed to a service and then there would be images to work with in the, for the data management team. And we would print reams of paper of listing data, looking through for errors. Um, and I, I kind of feel like when I think about data monitoring, I sometimes think back to those times where um, I feel like there was a, there felt like there was a lot more structure. And I guess we had a lot more to check because we didn't have the sort of instant checking that's going on with electronic databases. And as I said, when we had CRFs, even in the days of um, electronic CRFs, I remember the first ones we had were on a laptop at a clinical research site, and there was a, an electronic CRF that then had to connect to the database. So there were still two separate databases. And so you're sort of moving data around all the time, which um, you know, is more room for error. So I think um, data cleaning processes have changed significantly um, in the last 20 years. Um, but in terms of, so what do we do or what, what should you do? Um, you know, I think it's easier when you're in um, big organisations and there's teams to do these sorts of things. But when we're working in investigator-led studies or, um, you know, at sites um, running small studies, um, it can be overwhelming to know what you need to do. So I guess with data monitoring activities, we're looking for things like missing data or invalid characters. So numbers where you're expecting text and text where you're expecting numbers, out of range values, dates that don't make any sense, um, data that's not consistent with other data in other fields, um, repeated participant IDs, or um, just stuff to make sure that the data that you're working with will actually make sense. And, you know, I think when we're using electronic databases, a lot of this, uh, a lot of the electronic checks that can happen at the point of data entry um, are really advantageous to um, the quality of data that we're getting. And of course, then we need to do validation, um, checking across the patient um, and also 
it can be really interesting sometimes to look at the data across a site or um, across country, you know, just look at all the site, all the data for certain data points um, across a country. Um, sometimes you can pick up trends or um, things that look a bit odd by sort of reviewing the data as a whole. Um, another thing that has been very big for data monitoring, um, probably up until about the last maybe 10 years is source data verification. And so that's the um, comparing the data um, entered into the database against the medical records or whatever it is that the source data is um, at the clinical trial site. And um, sometimes the clinical trial database will be the um, source data. So there isn't anything to compare it against. Um, but in this situation, we're looking for um, accuracy um, and com completeness and representativeness of the data. So making sure that um, what data we're working with in the database actually matches the data um, at the source. Um, there's been a big move over the last probably more than 10 years now to risk-based um, monitoring. Um, I remember sort of probably 10 years ago when we were monitoring um, in pharma anyway, we would just go to site and monitor every single data point. And I think there's very little value in doing that, probably particularly in a developed place like Australia. Um, you know, the hours spent comparing every lab result on a lab report versus every lab result entered in a, um, in a database um, was really not time well spent. Um, and I think often with with those values, um, you know, if you have a, a typo by, you know, one or two numbers, if you're 19 instead of 18, um, once that comes out in the wash and the, anal and the analysis is done, that's really not going to have a major impact on the results. Um, so I think that's why we've sort of worked out that we can move towards um, focusing on the important data. So any data that is related to the primary outcome, um, that needs to be carefully considered. Um, and the other data um, maybe doesn't need to have as close attention paid to it. Um, some of the other data points that can be um, very time intensive in terms of monitoring resources is looking at concomitant medications, um, particularly if you know, in oncology trials or trials where there are a lot of medications or patients with chronic illnesses who have been on a lot of medications for a long time. Um, and I mentioned sort of the lab data, I think, um, you know, often if you're reviewing a whole set of chemistry results, when really you're only interested in um, lung function, uh, sorry, liver function, or, um, you know, neutrophils or um, white cells, then do you really need to be reviewing and collecting um, the whole suite of haematology results reported. Um, actually, that is my last slide, there you go. So um, Julie, I'll hand back to you and see if there are any questions. Thank you so much, um, uh, uh, Tracy and Kylie. Obviously, this is a huge topic area. Um, and I'll just throw while you all have a chance to think about um, questions to go in the chat, I'll throw out the first one. So a common dogma I, I hear is uh, why we do an investigator led, um, investigator led trials at the same level as a regulatory trial. I wonder, you know, Kylie and Tracy, if you have any views of why we should be doing investigator led trials differently. Uh, do you wanna go Tracy or? Um, yeah, I can say um, we had a speaker recently um, speak to the team and uh, her, her, her response to this was um, because there aren't any other standards, which I think is valid um, in the absence of any other standards that we should aim for um, the only standard that's available. But um, I mean, in investigator led studies where we're doing sort of more pragmatic trials that are likely to influence clinical practice, I think it is still really important that we um, ensure the integrity of our data. That would be my response to that. Carly, yeah. I don't know if you want to add. I mean, obviously I, I have, I've, it's been, GCP has been drummed into me as I'm sure it has to you, Tracy, 
um, throughout the being in the pharma industry, that's pretty much the upfront thing as always. But um, I think like the intent of GCP is to uh, protect patients and protect their data. So I guess why why would you not? You know, um, the data is so important. If people are going to give up their time take blood tests um, for us, then that's probably the least we can do is look after the data they provide. That's a really nice uh, approach from both of you. And, and the, the, the respect for the time and the donations made from the participants in, in, in the trials. Yeah, the, the respect is a, is a very important point. Uh, my approach has always been, uh, why should the uh, standards be any lower? Yeah. So. Uh, this great question from uh, Belinda. She's, um, she says, I don't think we should underestimate the importance of human data checking in conjunction with automated checks. As a statistician, this is where I most value my, my data manager. So how do you explain the value of those human checks to the sponsor or grant holder? That is a really interesting observation. And I think I agree with you, Belinda, but I think there probably needed to be a change in what we're doing when we're doing human checks. Um, you know, in some of the trials I've worked on, I think the eligibility, working out if a patient is eligible or not, which you can't necessarily always do from the information that's put into the database. So I think there's a lot of value there. I think it's the it's the sort of lab checks and um, that sort of... Um, looking for transcription errors, I think is probably the, the stuff where there's not much value. But I think, um, yeah, in the other, I guess it's just then, um, you know, planning where your time, where your monitor's time is is best spent and what can be done automatically. And a nice question from uh, Sandra Ware, particularly with the idea that, um, with the secondary use of data, we, we may not be working or accepting data from a team we're, we're, we're familiar with or just establishing a collaboration from. And she asks, are there particular risk-based monitoring tools anyone recommends? Um, I'd really be really interested to hear. I think um, risk-based monitoring is certainly what we're all about. Um, but I don't know that I've, um, in a few years of looking into risk-based monitoring, I haven't really found one tool that I think um, kind of gives us all the answers. Um, so I think everybody has their sort of own unique approach to it. Um, and I, I think it's a really, it's a tricky thing to explain how we do um, especially to people not from clinical backgrounds, you know, how we assess risks and then make the decisions on what we do. And it's the start of a conversation. So uh, it's the idea that the data management plan or the data monitoring plan is something that these individuals just go away and do and then someone signs it and it just gets filed in the study file. I mean, this to a certain extent can be a living document. This is something we should take out. We should think of a version control in it, but it's very much in the early, the earliest version, it's a discussion between the investigators, the data management team, the, 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 the statisticians, and, and to document, in, um, uh, you know, to document the decisions that, that, have, that, that have been made. You know, we are defining this is the primary data and, and we, we, will do the, we will do these processes based on this data. This other data, you know, particularly with lab data, we may be only interested in values outside of ranges for adverse events rather than it's a, um, it, it essential for, for trial efficacy or primary or even secondary outcomes. I love that point, Julie. I think, um, you know, perhaps previously the data management plan was something that data management managed but I think now with the complexity of trials and um, the variability in the data sources that we have I think it really does need to be a um, a team effort so yeah with input from um, you know the clinical people the stats the data managers just trying to sort of bring together exactly what data 
we're collecting, how we're collecting it, what we're doing with it, how we're checking it. So it's, um, I feel like it's kind of evolved out of the realm of only data management personally. Um, and I know that not, not just, you know, in, um, I guess, you know, I'm thinking if you're in a smaller team, um, it just needs input from different areas, not, you know, not necessarily lots of people, but lots of um, different functions. Yeah, I agree. And Kylie, there's some really nice comments in here about, uh, so thank you to, uh, to, uh, to Lindy, who mentions, of course, the NHMRC with their, their management of data and, and in, sorry, management of data and information in, in research. Are there particular resources that you, you turn to, um, Kylie, which are more useful than others? Um, so, uh... There's, there's actually a clinical, oh, now I can't remember, the Society of Clinical Data Management has a website um, which has quite a lot of um, good information on their data management specific. Um, I actually referred to that in, in my talk. It's one of my references. Um, but they have a, kind of a guide that they've put out covering all the areas of data management. Um, and a lot, I think a lot of these things... Um, you know, there's there's great guidance from all different areas, but a lot of it is is aligned. So you know, it's not that the NHMRC documents are quite different to GCP type documents, um, which is good. I think it's a uh, consistency. Um, I'm trying to think of what else. I think I forgot to mention data standards. So <laughs> what I meant to say <laughs> when you're when you're designing um, the the what the data elements that you're going to collect, I, I try to use a standard way of collecting that. Um, and CDISC is a good resource for data standards. It covers everything from data collection tools, uh, statistical analysis. Um, and it's really helpful to keep things in a standard way so that it's it's easily transferable and you can collect data together. You can use data across studies if you want to. Um, I just think, yeah, sorry, I forgot to mention that earlier. So CDISC is another one that I find quite useful. Uh, thanks, Kylie. And Sh Shakira mentions um, the, some of the issues that, that, that she has around uh, collection of, of, of data. And she likes the idea about only collect what, what's essential. Um, uh, Tracy or Kylie, have you any uh, any tips or hints about how you can approach this? Because it can be quite a difficult conversation to have with uh, a research teams. I think it's an ongoing issue. I've been, <laughs> <laughs> I've been fighting that uh, since I've been working in data management. Um, yeah, uh, a lot of stuff. A lot of we get a lot of people that want to collect these text fields everywhere and they're never going to be analyzed I'm like what well, that's not the place to collect them uh, I don't know I think it's just more a negotiation and explaining we only should be collecting what we're actually going to analyze in this format but uh, yeah Tracy I don't know if you have any better response um, for that I, I definitely think that but I do um, yeah because I feel like I have definitely always designed databases with um, very strongly opinionated statisticians. But Julie, I think, has a lovely outlook on it where she says, um, you know, if it helps them get the data, then, you know, I think, Julie, you encourage me to give a little bit on that side. But, yeah, we really, um, sometimes I think the more data you collect, if there's no actual plan or purpose for it, um, it, it kind of is just clutter. Yeah. And it just creates more work because if you have to clean that data and, and if there's missing data, you know, you need to follow up. And if it's the, something that's never going to be used. Uh, I, but I, I, I think that, yeah, obviously clinicians and scientists never want to say it won't be that, you know, oh, well, it might be really useful. It might be really interesting. So it's a challenge. Yeah. Definitely. Yeah. I often push back and say it's your sites who, who will be entering the, the, this data. I'm very keen to re reduce the burden on your site 
So I usually hedge it off in, in, in that sort of way. And I also relate all data I've, I'm asked to collect back to the objectives in the protocol. Okay, I understand that, that, you, that you need this for this re reason. Remind me which objectives in the protocol that's relating back to. And, and if they're uncomfortable formulating an objective or documenting potential post hoc uh, 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 analysis, that often helps me um, tiptoe gently around, around um, that, those sort of areas. But it would also a clear indication of, you know, concomitant medications are nice to have. Are you more interested in collecting classes of, um, so rather than asking for the patient to remember all the drugs they're on, are you more interested in tick boxes of classes of, of pain re re relief me medication rather than collecting all the different names and doses and routes of administrations and starts and stops and all the rest of it? Or maybe asking something like, did you take it within the last period of time and sort of uh, that sort of generalized information um, I think the difficult bit comes if they really don't know, and, and it, it, isn't it? it? It's around high, clear hypothesis and objectives um, for the collection of all, all data. And I find the H word, the hypothesis word, is quite often a difficult topic to bring up in a meeting. Um, there's some really great comments coming through in the chat here as well about the, um, the use of text-based uh, in, in information. Uh, as statisticians always go nuts about it because we're expected to check it and allow for typos. I, I suppose there's a question there, is there benefit of, if you have text-based, um, do you correct the, the typos in there or do you just leave them as is? Uh, as is, I don't know. I've never corrected a typo. <laughs> mm -hmm. it, if that's what they've entered, that's what they've entered. And Adrian has comments about excessive data can also harm the quality of the other data that you're interested in, you know, and, and they're right about exhaustion yeah, of data right. cleaning. Um, if, if there was particular take home messages you wanted for individuals today, do either of you have, you know, if you do nothing else, please remember this from, from my talk, uh, what sort of messages would you have that way? Uh, I would say the take home message is have a data management plan. <laughs> yeah. um, it doesn't have to be overly complicated, uh, you know, just, um, just have a document that talks about what data you're going to get, what you're going to do with it, where you're going to store it, and um, you know, just something that sort of encompasses um, the management of data through the life cycle of your um, project. And then, and in there, you can sort of talk about how you're going to ensure the quality. Um, yeah, it doesn't need to be um, hugely overcomplicated, but just um, something that shows the life cycle of the data that you're and in your study. Sorry, Kylie, I've probably stolen. No, <laughs> that, that's that was more exactly on your right. side. And, and uh, yeah, in creating this this whole presentation, it kind of occurred to me because I, I'm probably one of those people that just thought, okay, data management plan, here we go. But really reading into it, it's like, well, you use it how you need it. And it can be a really useful tool if used in the right way. Um, it can raise some really valuable questions that need answering and you don't want to answer them at the end of the study. You want to make sure everything's kind of documented and confirmed. So yeah, I think definitely have a data management plan. <laughs> <laughs> and the other important side of this is is individuals involved in multi centre trials, which include the UK and uh, and and Europe. There are additional considerations around. So the data management plan will often be needed for uh, government funding in the UK, and that they won't release funding until not only ethics is, is obtained, but also a data management plan. And that really goes around the um, uh, um, uh, uh, privacy data and the storing of electronic data and individuals' rights to access their data and, and to be for forgotten as, as well. And so, you know, it's better to be prepared now um, before it becomes, you know, it will increasingly become um, potentially become uh, enforced as, as, as we move forward. 
and you know as part of our, our funding opportunities and maybe also part of auditing uh, in in hospitals you know it'd be better to be prepare for the future now and it just to be part of your 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 routine and the way in which we ensure quality in our processes um, rather than having it sort of enforced in a, in a very strict way in, in the future. So if, there's, if there aren't any more questions, um, I'd like to take this opportunity to thank um, Kylie and Tracy for, for presenting and sharing their, their experience. You know, they both, you know, have a lot, lot to share. Um, and uh, look forward to our next presenters. Uh, Michael, I don't know if you could pop the slide back up again. Be great. Certainly. So we have two more in this webinar series. Our next speaker is, is Laurent, and he'll be talking about transparency and um, uh, data analysis with a particular uh, um, emphasis on stats analysis plans, but all around that. And then we're very lucky to have uh, Ursula presenting in the last of our series around the data lifecycle and the ethical use of, of data and changes which are afoot in, in re uh, regulatory um, uh, environments, as well as guidelines but from governments as, as well. So thank you all for your time today. Uh, this will be available as a recording. Um, uh, so please feel, feel free to share that.